I'd like to introduce um, Mark Partridge. Um, Mark Partridge is, remind me, thank you, the Swank Chair in Rural Urban Policy. I'm sorry, it's been one of those days. It's been hectic enough. I forgot to put on a tie. Um, of Rural Urban Policy in the department. He's a professor. Um, he's going to come and talk to us about uh, the broader economy right now, what it looks like, uh, and share with us his thoughts on that. So please give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Matt, and, and, and especially after that really happy news, I think we're all, uh, <laughs> I don't know how I could follow up after that great news from, uh, from the motherland, and, and especially after following my uh, colleague, uh, uh, Professor Sheldon, uh, in, uh, with his uh, British accent and everything, it's like following a PBS documentary. It must have been true what he said. So, uh, <laughs> so I understand it'll be a <laughs> be a lot of distraction here today after, uh, after all this news. Uh, okay, as, as, as Matt noted, I'm going to talk about uh, the broader national economy. And uh, generally, uh, uh, just a little bit of an overview. Uh, basically, uh, uh, last year I talked about will the real uh, economic recovery please stand up, and I was pretty negative. In fact, this has been a long-running, relatively negative stream of uh, comments when I've ever commented on the state or national economy for the most part since 2006. And unfortunately, uh, uh, my pessimistic assessments have been a little bit more accurate than the general consensus. If I, I go back and I look and did those things come true, and, you know, for, uh, for the most part, everything I said last year, you know, followed dead on except for one thing. And I, and I should, have, should know better as I did a little political punditry last year and I said, well, if the state, if this, the economy follows through with what I think it did and, and basically did follow through, uh, it, I, with the kind of job creation that's out there, I said it would be very difficult to see how a president could be reelected in that kind of a climate. And, you know, that one was way wrong. That one is definitely wrong. But the economic ones were much more accurate. However, this time I'm going to be actually a little bit more uh, optimistic. And I'll come on, I'll, I'll talk about why I'm going to be a little bit more optimistic about going forward. Uh, some of that is just a renorming of what is good performance. So, for example, if Ohio State's football team, you know, like last year went six and seven for the first time, that was a terrible tragedy. But if we keep going six and seven year after year after year after year, then one year we go eight and five, people will be pretty happy. And so, in that sense, uh, the new normal is that uh, I, I, this is no longer the 1990s. Uh, we're going to have to scale back growth expectations in the near future. Uh, the other factor going in is, is that a uh, lot of evidence, uh, Professor Sheldon referred to a lot of uh, uh, economic research, well there's a lot of economic research that suggests that coming out of a financial crisis just takes years. I mean it's not just an economic problem in fixing the economic problem, it's a real problem with psychology. We actually need psychologists in there and, you know, and, and, and trying to build people's confidence up and those kinds of things that are driving that and then, so it's really hard to recover after a, a, a crisis like that we just had. So what I'm going to do today is actually a little bit more, uh, some, some sense it would almost be like if this was a federal, if you brought in the Federal Reserve uh, uh, Chief of Research, say, from Cleveland or Chicago, and get, I'm going to have a lot of graphs. So I have more graphs than normal. Hopefully I won't be too overwhelming. But I'm going to provide some overview of where we are nationally and where we are in Ohio. I'm going to describe some forecasts by outside uh, people, which tend to generally uh, agree. One's from the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, Paris. Uh, International Monetary Fund, and the National Association of Business Economists, which surveys 60 economists, and now I'll present their median forecasts, and they, they tend to follow all in line. You know, I, I'm not necessarily sure that's good. That's always the case. Forecasters, one of the things about forecasters is if you're a forecaster, you don't want to be out there on the tail, because if you're wrong, you look pretty foolish. So they all tend to kind of herd in there at some consensus, and I'll give you their consensus, and I don't really dis necessarily disagree with their consensus, uh, and that might put me, you know, uh, the same way. Now I'm going to describe, though, how the U.S. stacks up compared to other advanced economies. Uh, I'm going to describe then why I think economic recovery, and in fact I said this last year, and why I think that's taking hold generally in real estate and why, I'm going to, why I think real estate is a key sector. And then I'm going to describe why I think the current expansion, though not exactly robust by 1990 standards or even robust by 1980 standards, or let alone earlier decades, why I think it's relatively broad-based. And we don't have any, ex I don't have any expectation, why most forecasters don't have any expectation, why the U.S. will head back into recession unless some sort of horrid shock hits. 
So, and then uh, given that, here is kind of an annual year-over-year -year, uh, notion of economic growth. And I want to note there, right there, about 2% in the mid middle part of the decade, collapsing then in the Great Recession, returning to about 2%. I want to note 2%. By 1990 standards, that wouldn't have been very great. But that, actually that was actually if I would take this thing out to about 2001, the beginning of uh, the recession, the dot-com bubble in the middle of 2001 when we had a recession, uh, there was just no recovery. It took years for economic growth, job, I should say job growth, to return. And so we got up to about 2%. That was the best we could do in the last 12 years is that, that little period of 2%, except for what I'm going to talk about in recent periods. So 2% was about the best we could do in the previous economic expansion. We did that for a couple years. Uh, in terms of what we've done recently, I've gone back to 2010. One of the reasons why is, is in February 2010, that's when national job growth numbers started to recover. That's when we started having some recovery in the, in the national employment situations in February 2010. And you see, this is year over year. So like that number would be the job growth between January 2009 and January 2010. We're losing about 4% jobs in the previous year. And you see since then, beginning in the end of 2010, we've been at about 2% job growth. So we're back right now. You know, if you look at the perspective of the last 12 years, we're certainly by the perspective of the 1990s, perspective of the 1980s, even the 1970s or 60s or 50s, this is not particularly good performance. But by the perspective of the last 12 years, we're humming along about the best we did in the previous economic expansion right now. So in that sense, not particularly great, but it was enough to get uh, a, a president reelected in, in what, what it would have been, if you take a long-term historical perspective, not particularly good economic environment. If you look at Ohio, Ohio, I, I would say, is actually doing better than our historical average. In, in other words, I don't think it's right to benchmark, you know, yes, Ohio job growth might be less than say it was in the 1990s, but that's not really the right metric. I think the right metric is how is Ohio doing relative to the country? And typically Ohio lags the country about a half a percentage point less job growth per year. Half percent, one percent less. And what you see here is in recession we were a little bit worse. Coming out of recession, we've actually in fact in recent months been slightly above the U.S. average and, and, you, and that, that's pretty good. Being slightly above the U.S. average is pretty good. Now, I want to know, and I have say this every year, I want to know, uh, one number you won't see me report is I don't talk about, and I can give you a thousand reasons why it's a useless piece of information, is the unemployment rate. Uh, in fact, uh, I watched poor Mitt Romney try to explain why the falling unemployment rate was really a, a mirage, which I, I would have agreed with this desc description of that number, but it's, uh, it, it's, hard. it's hard to technically make that argument. But nonetheless, he was right. I, I can go on and on and on on why economists, regional urban economists, don't use that number. Uh, but the job growth number, that's jobs. Those are people working. That isn't some, calling somebody on a survey and asking if they looked for work in the last four weeks. Uh, that's, that's, those are actual boots on the ground people working. That's, that's a real number. That's a number I can put a little bit of confidence in. We're doing better than the national average. Uh, so, the national, so what are some of the forecasts? Uh, uh, one is by the National Association of Business Economists. I'm going to take their median forecast. I've already warned you that forecasters are not the most courageous people in the world. Uh, they, will, they, they all heard about some number. And their outlook, and this, I quoted it there, is Teepin. That's from their press release, Teepin. GDP about 1.9%, uh, rising to 2.4% growth, accelerating to about a 3% pace by the end of the year. Again, by 1990 standards, this is not an economic recovery. This is not very good. Those are not very good numbers. But post-2000, looks doesn't look so bad. Uh, job growth is not going to be a particularly pretty picture. Uh, about a, they estimate about 155,000 jobs a month. Generally, we need about 175,000 people coming into the labor force, such that the share of the population that's actually working, notice I didn't say the unemployment rate, because that's, I've already noted, not a particularly useful number, such that the share of the workforce that's actually working stays about constant. And we're, pro we're probably going to be maybe right at best keeping that constant. One of the features about the U.S. labor market right now 
is the share of the population that's actually working is at levels we haven't seen since the horrible recession in the early 1980s. And I mean, in other words, it's a big turnaround because of, you know, if you f we're really into labor markets, and is female labor force participation is greatly higher. This really illustrates how men have just dropped out of the labor force since 2000. How, you know, how particular men across the board, especially older men, but men across the board have dropped out of the labor force. Uh, but on the positive side, they see housing starts rising 23% this year. I'll show that. Actually, they're probably going to be a little pessimistic. And 13% for next year. And I argue that's a really important number. Uh, the IMF, International Monetary Fund, they were right at the same number, 2.2%. Uh, this year, 2.1% for 2013, a lot of numbers. But the perspective is, compared to the rest of the, work, the other advanced economies, they see them only growing about 1.3 and 1.5%. U.S. doesn't look so bad if you, if you pull out a reasonable benchmark in that sense. Uh, this is the OECD's forecast, and I don't know how visible that is, but it ha I pulled it out because I wanted to show you where the growth is coming from. Their forecast looking like all these others. And so this is U.S., uh, US uh, their forecast is 2.2% to 2.8, accelerating at the end of next year, that they think growth will really pick up at the end of next year. And they see, and I think this is good news, private consumption is lagging the average. Government consumption, depending on your point of view, has been pulling down growth. A lot of work showing the government cutbacks in government beginning in 2011. The state and local level and somewhat at the federal level pulling down growth, uh, investment being a very positive factor, public investment down, but private investment, whether it's non-residential or residential, that's accelerating 15% next year. A lot of the growth coming from investment. And that's a good sign that, bear, that bodes well for the future. That one of the things is we've had a capital strike. Capital, people investing in capital have gone on strike. And the fact that they're starting to investigate in the economy is a good sign for future growth. So that's where the growth will take place, especially on the investment side. Government pulling down growth, that's probably going to continue. But private sector investments, one of the fact, one of the positive, that's, a, that's nice. I, uh, if these, somebody has, wouldn't be able to say that for years in a forecast. So how does that compare to the rest of the world? This is from OECD. OECD, this is GDP growth, and that's hard to see, but that'd be GDP growth in 2011, 12, 13, 14. So this is the U.S. That's the, uh, that's the U.S. Here's Great Britain. Here's Japan. Here's Italy, uh, DEU, uh, Germany, France, and Canada. And what I want you to note there, I want you to notice is that the U.S. is the star of the group. You know, it's kind of a bad group. You know, the benchmark's a pretty, you know, pretty grim group. But among that pretty grim group, the United States is actually the leader in that group. So in that sense, I mean, given the financial crisis that hit the entire world, there's been various responses to the financial crisis. I think the Federal Reserve here in the United States has done a much better job than counterparts in Japan and Europe. We're actually doing relatively, rel note the word relatively, relatively better than the rest of the world. I want to note the performance of Canada because that's, uh, I got asked this question last year. It's a really interesting question. I mean, really, Canada's a really interesting case. They weren't hit by the financial crisis to the extent of the United States, but they've undergone massive structural issues in Canada, you know, complete structuring. And, uh, on the positive side, Canada's had uh, gr large numbers of uh, energy-related exports, especially for the province of Alberta. Western Canada's done quite well. Canada, Susca uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan in particular have done relatively well with commodity booms. That's bid up the Canadian dollar a lot. This is called Dutch disease. It bid up the Canadian dollar very significantly, which means if you're in Ontario, you can't export. If you're in Montreal or Quebec, you can't export if you're a manufacturer. Growth in the commodity sector has almost been exactly identically offset by shrinkings in the manufacturing sector, leading to, uh, you know, okay, but not necessarily great economic performance. You know, classic example of Dutch disease, how, how, how the economy is not just a, how one sector is doing, but it's how the whole economy is responding to those uh, shocks to it. Uh, okay, so what are some downside risks to this uh, We'll call it as cheery as an economist can be forecast. Uh, one is the fiscal cliff. And the fiscal cliff is approximately 
basically be wonderful. It'd solve our budget deficit problems. We would have very few budget deficit problems if we went off the so-called fiscal cliff uh, because tax rates would go up to the 1990s levels, uh, uh, spending would be cut, especially defense spending would take a little bit disproportionate hit. Uh, I'm not particularly worried about that. I think you know, is that uh, the incentives are relatively strong for the politicians to do some, something. However, even, even if uh, uh, the politicians did relatively little, I'm not particularly pessimistic that that would be as damaging as, say, the pundits have suggested. And the reason is, is I'll go back. If you were like a, a groupie of my to Outlook talks, you'd remember years ago I was saying that the stimulus impact was more was more changing confidence. You know, something being done to illustrate there's some demand in the economy to stop the collapse of the economy, but it didn't have these massive multiplier effects and massive job creation effects that a, a lot of, you know, jobs created in the government sector tended to be offset by losses elsewhere in the economy. And so I, I argue that the so-called Keynesian effects, multiplier effects were, were, were overstated by many. And likewise, if, I, if that's what I believe, then, then I'll, for the same reason, if the government pulls out of the, if government, if go, less government spending, less government activity will be partially offset by other aspects of the economy, more private sector activity, uh, uh, more exports in particular, and so on. So I, I'm not as particularly a, a, a pessimistic about that having this massive adverse effect on the economy, and that'd be where I'd be coming from. Where I'm actually a little worried, could remain worried is the Euro crisis. And as, as Professor Sheldon accurately pointed out, as the European Union, especially the, the, Euro, the Eurozone, has gone into recession. They'll likely stay in recession in 2013. And it's, it's a really difficult situation in the Eurozone right now. Uh, in particular, I think their problem is not austerity. I mean, they're, they're probably, yes, Greece, Greece's fiscal policy is a train wreck. But the rest of the European Union was, for the most part, running relatively, relatively reasonable fiscal policy. The problem is, is that their response, some sort of forced austerity, is really not the, the solution. The real problem, because they don't really want to address the real problem, the real problem is they came up with a really bad idea, and that was called the euro. The euro was a really bad idea. The American economists pointed out this thing's going to, not, this thing isn't put together very well. You have a crisis, you're going to be in big trouble. And uh, their, real, their real problem is to make the euro work, which they now need to do, is they need a political union. They need to quit saying, well, no, Greece, you know, they're really, you know, they were a bunch of irresponsible people and we're not happy. They got to quit doing that. That, that. That's true, the Greeks were irresponsible, but the real problem is they have to have transfers from wealthy countries to countries that are suffering economic problems. I don't care how unfair that seems to German taxpayers. They want that thing to hold together. They're going to have to have a political union. And, uh, and with that hanging over, that kind of shock hanging over the global economy, and still trying to deal with an austerity problem, and the real problem remains, the euro is still structurally not set up very well, is, is problematic. You know, without the euro, Greece, this would have been a non-story. Greece would have cut spending lowered interest rates, depreciated their currency, increased exports, and all would have been well. So, uh, uh, you know, it would have been a non-story. The real story is they're stuck in this straitjacket called the euro, and they're not willing to make the political adjustments. Okay, so now quickly about housing. Why I think housing is the real story. Uh, those of you who took macroeconomics maybe suffered or liked the, the story of Keynesian economics, and you talked about multipliers and everything. If you actually read Keynes's book, and I suffered through it, it is a, it, it's, it's, it's not good bedtime reading. Uh, it, he talked a lot about changing expectations, getting people to think asset prices were going to go up, they'll start investing in the economy of growing. It wasn't, that's really what Keynes kept talking about, how to change expectations towards asset prices. And you really see where you, the red is U.S. compared to Canada. The red is residential investment. And you see 2000, 2000, 2007, we had positive growth through residential investment. It collapsed. It's still shrinking. Finally, this year, it turned positive. And, one, and the other feature is, finally, residential prices are moving up. We're getting around 3% national growth in how, median housing prices. I view that as really important in the sense that it'll be a positive shock to GDP, 
but also people feel more comfortable about investing in assets in the broader economy and economic growth and investment. Who's going to invest when you think your, that your asset values are going to fall over time? I think this is an important turnaround if we talk about economic growth. So, not, so yes, you get a bump from housing and investment, but the changing expectations about asset prices, people then willing to invest because they think assets will be going up, is really important. We're seeing that in housing starts. This gives you a feel where we were in the middle of the decade. These are annual housing starts on a month, showing monthly data at an annual basis, collapsing. And since, that looks like a big collapse, it may not look like much, but housing starts are about doubled since the bottom in 2009. Still, we got a, still got a ways to go. We got upside, but there's, 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 that's why I think growth can take place. Last thing is, good news is, uh, the, well, the uh, good news is economic growth is pretty broad-based. Whenever you look at an economy and you're going to say, is it going to grow, you want to see it broad-based across the whole economy, not one sector leading the way. And another factoid is a lot of the time with the politicians or advocacy groups are trying to convince you it's just not what's driving the economy. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about that. This illustrates, and I split up because polit various politicians, various stripes, focused on where I have it circled. And this shows February 2010 when job growth resumed, October 2012. I split out manufacturing into durable and non-durable. I have it here, but I split it out. Durable manufacturing being cars. Then I have mining. Mining includes energy, anything related to energy development. That shows where the job growth has been since uh, uh, job growth resumed in February 2010. And what I want to notice is that, and I'll even talk about Ohio numbers, uh, here in a second, you know, a lot of money was spent in the political campaign by advocacy groups trying to convince us that energy was a big driver of national job growth. And, and you, these are just, these, that's the data. You can decide if, if five million private sector jobs were being driven by that. Uh, likewise, one of the political campaigns tried to argue that an auto bailout was driving the economy. This is all of durable manufacturing, uh, not particularly and I'll, talk, I'll, I'll split out auto a little bit, bit, little bit later. Where we're getting, really getting our growth is in this traditionally where we've, all, where we've got it since the 1960, late 1960s, in the service part of the economy. In other words, it's basically growth, but, but that's where growth's taking place, but it's broad-based. It's, it's really not, and in fact, I'll show you some more recent numbers. It's taken across, across the entire economy, we're seeing growth. We're seeing growth across the entire economy. That's a really nice sign. It's not like one sector leading the way, and if it crumbles, then the whole house of cards falls in. It's broad-based. Uh, if you look at it since in the last year, uh, this is in percent change. This shows percent change growth. I just want to note, this is gro annual growth rates in the last year. Hey, that's pretty broad-based. You know, you know, outside of the, the ongoing disaster in the information IT sector, She's been going since the dot-com bubble. Relatively broad-based growth across every sector, you see 2% growth. And that's nice. That means it's not like one sector. The whole economy's pulling along not really nice. It's hard to see how, how, unless it's really hit hard, how an economy like that can, can falter. Ohio's an, this is also a similar story. This is change in Ohio employment going back to the national uh, February 2010. We've created since then about 350,000 private sector jobs. Uh, the, same, the same split, uh, you know, I split out mining, I mean, sorry, non-durable and durable. And a lot of our growth, though durable manufacturing is okay, pretty good in, in Ohio, I want to note that that's always the case coming out of recession. That, uh, you know, one of the political candidates was arguing that they, they've turned around manufacturing. And actually, coming out of recession, we always, with the exception of one recession in 2001, manufacturing's always been a leader out of recession. It would have been a story if manufacturing wasn't above the average. But that's across the board. We see pretty good growth in Ohio. This would be the last year where we're seeing growth. And this would be in percent change form. And uh, where, again, the leader uh, you know, we see you know, professional and, and durable both growing relatively fast in terms of jobs. The service sector being much bigger, it's been more pulling up the economy. So I think this is a good sign 
for Ohio. This broad-based growth is really a good sign. It means that we have small businesses investing. It means we're having growth across the board. Last year, I said I thought a positive feature of uh, the current government situation in Ohio was that uh, I was impressed by how the governor was able to solve the state's fiscal problems in a, in a, in a credible manner. And then we could sit around and disagree with how he did it, but I think we could agree it was credible. You know, it, it was a credible, you know, so I don't think anybody's now saying we have a structural deficit. We may, have, we may have other issues from that budget, but we don't have a structural deficit. The good news is, is whenever businesses say, hey, we don't have a structural deficit, that's always a sign that you're, that, that you're probably not going to get weird tax increases, weird spending cuts. You're going to have some confidence, some certainty about where business will be going. So I, I think the pitch, I don't want to overstate the Ohio picture, but Ohio looks, you know, for the first time, and I think somebody doing this maybe since the mid-1990s could tell a fairly positive story about where Ohio's headed. Uh, so this shows, though, the national story on durable manufacturing. And I just want to note that motor vehicles and motor vehicle parts would be about 150,000 jobs of the 5 million jobs created nationally. If you're to look at Ohio, in Ohio, the story is even less, that of the 40,000 durable manufacturing, if you look at motor vehicle, motor vehicle parts, it's only about 5,000 of the jobs since February 2010. In other words, for whatever, Ohio, I said, is doing much, much better. The data, the data clearly shows that. I think, though, it'd be incorrect to suggest, though, that the auto bailout played a, a massive role in that. That just, it just isn't supported by, just simple, that you just can't support it with those kind of, those are just, I'm just pulling raw numbers there. Likewise, uh, another story nationally that was told, just to give you a feel for, for national stories, is this is looking at the mining sector. I've already noted the mining sector's relatively small part. This shows where the mining sector was creating its jobs since February 2010. Uh, this, is the oil, this is oil and gas support. This is oil and natural gas. So these, these guys here are people clear, for the most part, clear drill pads and so on. They're counted as mi in the mining jobs. Those are people actually working for the companies. Uh, this would be coal employment, uh, and that's the net. That would include things like gravel or copper, and you add it all up, you get the net mining sector employment. Point again, uh, if you were to if you look at the bottom numbers, actually in the last year, or I'm sorry, look back. You actually go back in the last year, the numbers are not, not massive. You know, 12,000, 16,000 in the energy sector. It's about 28,000 jobs nationally. We created about 2 million private sector jobs. Coal, we've had a little bit of loss. You have more natural gas. It's going to offset some coal jobs that would have taken place. The general story is mining likewise, not a major driver. The real story is how across the board we see economic growth. And, I, and, it's in, and that across the board, diverse economic growth always trumps one sector growing. So despite a lot of money being spent by various groups trying to convince people otherwise, there isn't one, there's, it's hard to find one sector driving the economy. The data doesn't support that, but that's actually very good. That means we have diverse growth across the entire economy, and it's more likely to have a resilient economy to economic shocks. So I will conclude with that, noticing that uh, I agree with the consensus forecast that we should expect modest economic growth. Uh, I think we're going to avoid any kind of severe fiscal contraction. I think Ohio is going to slightly trail the national average, but, but remember I've already benchmarked Ohio. Slightly trailing the national average is actually a win, because we typically rather significantly trail the national average, and that growth is going to be led by the uh, housing sector. That, that turnaround, I think, is a key element to say that we now have sustained economic recovery. And, however, I'm not happy with the growth numbers. That means that with this kind of growth, even though I said it's kind of the new normal, we're growing at 2 2.5% a year. We can't solve the kind of societal problems we want to solve with that kind of growth. I mean, we're not going to grow our way out of a budget deficit, for example. Uh, and uh, that new normal will likely be the case until we get some sort of productivity increases likely coming from some sort of innovation. Why the 1990s was such a boom 
was, you know, there was stable policy and, you know, and so on, but there was also some massive productivity increases coming from the information sector and innovations information sector. And right, you know, innovation by its very nature, you can't predict. I mean, I wish I could predict. I'd be a millionaire. But that's probably, we're going to need that innovation to actually start growing at a faster rate. So, uh, but putting that kind of mediocre performance, hey, we're not doing so bad if you compare us to other countries. They've, they've actually handled this much worse than us. We can talk about Ben Bernanke and people criticized him. I would say compare him to his colleagues around the rest of the world and he looks, he looks pretty good. And, and uh, I've already noted the broad-based nature. So I'll stop there and uh, take some questions. Uh, what about that? Well, uh, that's why we have the rest of this thing. Is that uh, hopefully, hopefully my colleagues, hopefully my colleagues will fill in. We'll do 40 minutes for the rest of the economy and the rest of the day on agriculture. Oh, why well, doesn't it show up on my graph? That's a great question. In fact, here, let me just tell you a quick aside. One of my colleagues does a forecast, and he didn't have agriculture there. And some Congress uh, in Oklahoma, some congressperson from Oklahoma, you hate agriculture. And my colleague had to explain to the congressperson that, no, that's not the case. The data, on, the data I was using was on employment. The employment data on agriculture is they just don't collect it on a monthly basis. They just don't collect agriculture. They collect uh, numbers of crops. They collect prices. They collect a lot of volume data. But on jobs and boots on the ground, there's just no data there. And, uh, and so it's unfortunate. It's not some sort of bias on my part. It's just it's, it's the dang way the data is reported. Yes? Well, net farm income is a record, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, agriculture, I wasn't, I wasn't at all. I was just saying, why don't I have agriculture in my employment graph? Is there a connection between the fertility rate that we heard earlier and economic growth? I don't think, you know, I, I'm not a big believer. A lot of people have drawn correlations, and they draw a correlation between the fertility rate and economic growth. And, I, and I'm not a real big believer in that, and I'll tell you why. Let me, let me tell you a positive story from our current falling fertility rate that I think should be told more often. If we have fewer workers, and this would be the same story, I could tell the same story about the energy sector, how the energy sector saw its innovation. We have fewer workers. That's going to create a lot of incentives for firms to come up with new innovations so that they don't have to use workers, and we're going to have a lot of productivity growth. And I don't, th you know, I don't think that kind of productivity growth induced from a labor, you know, falling labor force is, uh, has been told. The other feature is right now, even if you don't have that innovation, I've already talked about a jobs crisis in the economy since 2000. We have employment population rates that are look like 19, the recession of the early 1980s today. We have a lot of room. There's a lot of manpower out there that could potentially work in the labor force. So right now, I don't, I don't, you know, a lot of, I don't, I don't buy the dire predictions from fertility. Anything else? Well, well, thank you. I think we got we, somebody here is going to charge a lunch, so he's a very important person. A couple things very briefly uh, before we hit lunch. Uh, the first thing I do want to say, you have this kind of, does anybody know what color that is? Greenish? Lime. Lime. Thank you. I can tell he works at Ohio State. Uh, we have this piece of paper here that is an evaluation. Uh, if you'd take a couple minutes, um, you know, take a couple minutes while, while it's still fresh and uh, give us some comments and feedback on this meeting, uh, just feel free at the end of the day to leave it in your chair. Uh, we do value your comments truly. If we're going to put the time and effort in that Nicole and Janice have, have put into this, I'd like to make it worth everybody's time. And the best way for us to know if it's worth your time is to hear it directly from you. Uh, the other thing, we actually have dug up a celebrity to join us, so I'm going to welcome to the stage for his um, sort of traditionally, uh, traditionally, traditional experience, or, uh, appearance, uh, Dr. Bobby Mosier, who is, what is your title now? I don't know. I don't know about that. Okay. Uh, he may be the only person in the college who doesn't have a title. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. <Yeah. clears throat>
Th thank you very much. And you notice he introduced me as a celebrity, and I don't even sign his check anymore. I mean, that's, that's pretty good, man. I'm, I'm impressed. Thanks to all of you for being here. You know, we started this several years ago, and it's been a very popular event, and uh, you always come and participate, and this is what makes it good, is your participation, your interaction. And, of course, we take this out across the state, and it becomes a, a part of the whole program throughout the whole winter season. But uh, thank you for being here. We always have a little bit of time to introduce a few people, just a few people. Now, if we introduced all the important people in the room, we'd have to introduce every one of you, okay? So we're just going to get a few people here that we're going to introduce here before, uh, before lunch. And I know lunch is out there, so I'm not going to take much time. Elected officials and agency folks, directors that we've got here today. We've got one elected official, I think. Gary Shear. Where's Gary? Right here. Gary? Stand up, Gary. Be recognized. <clears throat> Gary comes from the, uh, the Circleville area. And so any other elected officials here that, that we've missed? Okay, very good. Uh, the USDA agencies, Tony Logan, director, farm Sur I mean, of uh, rural development. Tony, you got some other people with you. Could you have your people stand? Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, Steve, Steve Meyer. Steve, I, uh, yeah, Steve. You, I know you got several people with you. Would you? Oh, <laughs> okay. All right. Very good. Thanks, Steve. <clears throat> and then uh, Director of ODA, Dave Daniels. Dave. Thank you for being here. You got some people with you too, Dave. Yeah. You got several. We got oh, some of them are sitting right there. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, Cheryl Turner. Cheryl, she is with uh, NAS, National Ag Statistics Service. Cheryl, just you. Thank you for being here. Okay, that's the folks we want to introduce. Thank you very much.